This meeting is being recorded. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody to the college tonight. And uh, we're featuring, there are two rules to college. The first one is no personal attacks. And the second one is one fool at a time. The college consists of the following format. One, we'll have a brief announcements period. Two, then our speaker will speak. Then three, we'll have our uh, question and answer period. And at the end, we'll have a rebuttal period. At the end, we will, um, at the end of the uh, program, we'll have our uh, infamous rebuttal period. So anyway, if you'd like to start with the announcements, Charlie, I'll go ahead. All right, you're gonna cut it off? Yeah, I'm doing that right now. Okay, welcome everyone to meeting number three. In. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, so take it away, uh, Bob. You're on. You're on. You're you're ready to go. Okay, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Charlie. And thanks to both of you for keeping the college alive all these years. And also I wish we could go back to Dappers and Charlie would let us go back and be friends again, meet and talk to me. And be more personal, much more personal than this is. And there's so many friends there. No, I really like to go back. And I see no You're having there. trouble with your sound, Bob, because we're getting some static. I hear a little static. I don't know where it's coming from. Maybe it'll go away. Okay, well, we can, it's, it's gone away now. Okay, yeah. Hope we go back to Dappers soon. They have hundreds of people in there every day. I know. Okay, but um, my topic tonight is uh, making meaning, especially how to make meaning. Now, I define meaning as the positive impact of a person, the effect that a person has, their relationship to um, other people mostly, or to the world too. <laughs> Who's that? That was Bob, I had to mute him. Oh, um, yeah, uh, meaning is the impact that we make with our lives. And I'm concerned that we have good impact and that we live the best lives that we can. That's why I studied philosophy. I'll tell you a lot more about that later. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, why are we here? Why do we exist? I say the answer, the best answer to that question, that big question, the biggest perhaps of all questions, is we're here to make meaning and to make as much of it as we can. Why else would we exist? What better reason could we have? <clears throat> That's what hit me. I'll tell you when. Um, but um, meaning is also our purpose, the purpose that we have in our lives, what purpose we, we give to them, what we make for them, what we find for them too. I think meaning exists in the external reality <clears throat> and is objective. Many people think it's totally subjective and people have different meanings for different things. That's certainly true, <laughs> of course, but that's a fact. That's a fact. Um, that's not <clears throat> what I'm talking about. I'm talking about values, what's important, what we ought to prize throughout our lives. And to me, that's meaning and making meaning and making the most of it as we can, as I have said. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about tonight. <clears throat> Many ways of making meaning and why do it. And that's a huge task and it sounds very subjective. It's one of the ideas in the humanities and it's a very subjective field. But um, Hercules couldn't have beaten this 
monster meaning. But I have a bit of more powerful weapon than, than Hercules has. I have logic at my side, the rules of logic, the laws of logic. They're universal. <laughs> they apply to all people at all times. There's rules. There's rules for thinking, good thinking and bad thinking. These were discovered by Aristotle in the fourth century BC. <clears throat> and then they've never been refuted, uh, at least not at all effectively. They've been added to in deduction a little and induction. Those are two big branches of logic. But most of logic concerns thinking. Although I think we could use some more development on that in the future. But this will be my guidelines. And this will be what I use to judge um, what I say and my beliefs throughout this talk tonight. So, so I do have a method of proceeding that's logic. And that's my guide, guide, guidance and judge. And it is a good criterion. It's a universal criterion. As I said, it holds true for all societies <clears throat> at all times. Okay. Well, I said meaning is not really descriptive. I'm not talking about meaning in the sense that <clears throat> what something means to a person. That's a strictly subjective sense. That's prime. Yeah. What I'm talking about is meaning in a prescriptive sense. I'm talking about meaning as a value. Uh, meaning, oh gee, meaning as um, something we ought to prize, as I have said. And I think we all cry out for meaning to have our lives mean something. And as Albert Camus, who many of you have heard of, said, there's one but truly philosophical question, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. The rest is games, and I agree with Camus completely. Albert Camus, the Nobel Prize winning writer. Um, <laughs> Yeah, if your life lacks meaning, you'll commit suicide. You'll end it all. That's how important it is. It's the only idea you, you would do this for. And everyone has, everyone has meaning, some meaning, because we all have effects. We all have an influence on our society and on other people. With everything we do, we have meaning. Often this is small. Um, almost always, but it can be bigger and it and can be a big cumulative process. And that's what meaning mostly is. It's a process. It's not one thing so much. And through the process, I think all people could have um, meaningful lives and can make meaning for others. If they just focus on what's meaningful, on what's important, it's another one of the 70 meanings of meaning. That I use that word and I counted them. I wrote them down from my journal when I had a journal, a quarterly journal, 16 pages long. I mailed out to subscribers <clears throat> trying to develop the idea of the meaning of life. Back then I was kind of on the wrong track, excuse me. And um, I did have one big success with my journal. I wrote a little letter to the Tribune saying I got a journal on the meaning of life might make a different article. And I knew they were looking for different things. I started off to Tribune and believe it or not, they sent out an excellent reporter, John Anderson. Some of you might remember he wrote the City Watch for many years in the trip. And he came and he wrote a fine article. 
on my journal and my quest. I'll mention them again later. Um, I got 3,400 subscriptions from this article and was reprinted in 35 other newspapers. But um, how did I get on to that? <laughs> I'm talking, oh, we have a cry for me. Um, I think we could approach all subjects from the point of view of their meaning. And they would, they would be very different than if you emphasize that. Now we just describe them. Factually, scientifically, is the ideal if you have that kind of subject matter. But um, <clears throat> we um, not looking for that. We're looking for what matters, what's important, what's meaningful. I mean, that's that's what I think we're all looking for. We don't find it much, and uh, I think we could make an entire new field of um, study called meaningology, where we study things in terms of their meaning, what they mean to us, not just what they are, what they ought to mean. And of course, all the sciences that way, all the arts, it'd be a new field. Maybe I'll develop in my next book. I just published my eighth book on making meaning. It's a book of aphorisms. or short sayings about the meaning of life. It's 200 pages, no, no, sorry about it. It's 200 pages, uh, short sayings about making meaning. Uh, 200 pages long. And you, and you could um, take a look at my books if you're so inclined on my website. Called BobLichtenberg.org. Uh, if you could spell my name, you can get it from Charlie's program. BobLichtenberg.org tells us about some of my books. I had one reader who got that part of meniology and he said he quit reading it because of that. But I, I need to contact him and find out what upset him about that. I guess he thought it was pompous. And some people say it's pompous to talk about meaning and the meaning of life. I gave a talk at the College of Complexes on the meaning of life. This was in 1980 when Lionel de Spain was running it. I think that makes me the oldest uh, regular at the College of Complexes, even though I haven't been very regular lately. I don't like Zoom as a way of meeting. But um, that makes me a, an older, regular than Charlie, even. <laughs> but anyway, okay, let's move on. Okay, um, Bob, I have a copy that I'd like to put up of your website to share screen for a minute. Would you object? No, certainly. Go ahead, Tim. Okay, I'm going to put his a copy of his uh, website up just in case you guys want to see it. Bob Lickettenbert.com. And there is his books, Making Meaning. And he's got other oh. books there too that you can seek your meaning, Making Meaning, Seeking the Most Successful Life, and a few others. So uh, you can get to it. I'll put the link, I'll put the uh, website in the chat. And Bob, I hope you didn't mind a little bit of a plug for your website there. So go oh, right ahead. I, and I want to get the message out, the message of making meaning. Um, I recommend of my books, Making More Meaning as an um, ideal starting book of, to read of mine. It's only 55 pages and talks only about making meaning and the sources of making meaning, which I'm going to go into soon. But um, yeah, Making More Meaning is only 55 pages. If you're looking for a full development and making meaning, it's over 200 pages. Um, but I started making meaning because my life lacked much meaning from the start. My family didn't care anything about me. They paid no attention to me. My father was a binge alcoholic. He was constantly embarrassing me. 
humiliating me, treating me rudely, putting me down. He wouldn't buy me a Coke and said he had to buy himself another beer at the bar. Of course, he was drunk at the time, but stuff like that, a little kid doesn't understand. I felt very bad by, my, by myself. I had no self-confidence whatsoever. <clears throat> and so I thought I'd go into philosophy as my way of learning about how to um, live a good life, because that's what I thought Plato and his buddies, Aristotle and Socrates, were talking about. Turns out they were not, hardly not much at all. Socrates a little. We only have four of his dialogues for him. Oops, where's my hand? <laughs> Four, four dialogues from Socrates. And then Plato got off the track very fast. Oh, he did some excellent work and Aristotle was very technical and very picky and very dry. Uh, so I had to do it on my own. I had to make my own study. I had to go through all the hoops of studying philosophy so I could study it and teach it my rest of my life. And I did that mostly at Tulane University in New Orleans. Where, where I won a full scholarship. They paid all my tuition, room and board, and a stipend that allowed me to eat out on excellent New Orleans food, like gumbo and jambalaya. It was cheap. Back then, it's not now, and I met my super sweet wife there. A Southern Bell, which you want me to hear, but I digress. I, that was the start of my making meaning. I went down to Tulane in New Orleans to study. I leaped through all the hoops, I did boring courses. But the professors were all abusing tenure anyway. They didn't lecture at all whatsoever. They just sat there and made us give papers. Well, we didn't know what we were doing. We were trying to learn from them for crying out loud. But like I say, I got through it. <clears throat> and I taught philosophy for 40 years, usually as an adjunct, which is better for me, except financially. <laughs> I was screwed royally. But um, I had a blast. I could focus only on philosophy, teaching philosophy, studying philosophy, and learning it. So that's what drove me to meaning eventually one day I was holding my uh, newborn son and I said, <clears throat> I just want my life to have meaning for him and other people. And that, at that time the word meaning struck me. I said, that's the right word. That's the word I'm looking for, meaning, I want meaning in my life and his and everyone else's. And I stayed with it since then. It was 38 years ago, but it's been a long, slow road. Starting mostly with my journal and then my books and then my teaching. All right, well, um, what, what time is it? I don't know what time it is. Recording has stopped. This meeting is being recorded. All right, I have no idea what time it is. 6.35. Yeah, 6, 6.34, you got plenty of time, Bob. Okay, you know, you go, to, go to about, you go to about 7.15, 7.30, it's no problem. Just take your time and then we'll uh, get you uh, in time for questions and rebuttals. So go ahead and keep going, okay? Actually, it's 11.35 it's 11 GM, so. Uh, London, you're about five, five, no, five hours ahead, right? I, uh, yeah. Well, at okay. least one person there knows what time it is. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, I got it. Let me start. Keep, keep, keep going. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna start now with the sources of meaning because these are the main ways we can make meaning is through different sources of air or avenues of making meaning. And there's nine of them, main ones that I count. The first one is relationships, quality relationships to other people. Um, what the heck?
friendships, love, stuff like that. It had a lot of meaning to life. Friends I made at the college mean a lot to me. Made good friends there. And it was very important to have people on the same wing league as myself. They had a lot of quality in my life. But you can't really control your friends. You wouldn't want to anyway. But um, often they're not going to respond as you would like them to. So um, I think the best account of friendship is from a theologian named Martin Buber. My buddy Buber, he talks about the I and thou. And the highest human relationship is when you say thou to another person, thou. <laughs> As long as I want to stay in it. As long as I want to stay in it. Pardon me? Thou, the boober, is almost sacred. Well, it's the old word for God. The, use, the Hebrews used to address God. They call him thou. Uh, but now it just means someone almost holy. And Bubba says we should regard the other person as that. Um, and say thou, and speak it thou. Speak about what's unique in every situation about the other person. Speak about major events in their lives. Why not? Why talk trivia? Why talk politics? It's not going to get you far, if anywhere. But saying thou can make, add much meaning to your life. But Boober's ideas are way too complex to present here. He wrote, he wrote 30 some books, no, 70 some books in several languages. <laughs> um, one other thing that has a good account of a um, personal relationship I found is Mark Twain in the novel Huckleberry Finn. Huck and um, Slave Jim escape to the river, which symbolizes freedom. Mississippi. And um, Huck is very prejudiced, as typical of his society at the time. And he regards Jim as a nigger. <coughs> Excuse the word, but that's the word in the book. And everyone else did too, except other blacks. But they're on this river and they're trying to get to Illinois. <laughs> of all places, Cairo, Illinois. And um, Huck comes to realize Jim's trying to be free, just like he is, and they have much in common. Um, and this is what Mark Twain calls flesh and blood thinking. Eventually, by being on this raft in the Mississippi, <clears throat> Huck, Huckleberry Finn, was able to regard Jim as a real flesh and blood person, just trying to be free as he was basically. And he overcame his prejudice. And that's one of the many good lessons in Mark Twain. Many of my relationships lack meaning with my parents certainly and my brothers because we came to disagreements about them. And friends would often betray me. They didn't want to do anything except at the college. They wanted to talk. They didn't want to see plays or movies or go to talks. Very few of them. So <clears throat> friendship is a great meaning, but it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult. Certainly not easy. Second source of meaning is to have a sense of community. Community is a group of people who uh, work together for a common purpose or a goal to achieve things that they agree upon. Lights. And they all work together. And that gives a lot of meaning if you could get into a community and work to achieve a goal, like the College of Complexes does that. We talk social issues and current events 
and even philosophy every week since 1951, although we missed a few weeks, I'm sure. But um, it doesn't take that much to create a community, a few hours a month. Because you know, you're going to have meetings once a month. You know, and you get a lot of meaning that way. We need to bring it back. We've lost it, we lose it more every day. Stores are being sold by chains. It's hard to find an individual. I mean, stores are. There are all the stores are chain stores these days. There's not many um, individual stores. We're losing a sense of community with, to the computer. Everyone's in their computer, walking down the damn street, looking at the thing. They're addicted to it. Addicted. And that's not personal. That, that's not a community. That's not even reality. It's virtual. I recommend Plato's ideas and that he expressed in his book, The Republic, which is readable, although it's quite long. Where he talks about the ideal society. And uh, again, his ideas are too complex to summarize here. He thought a community would be balanced or healthy, just like um, the individual would be. It would be just a bunch of individuals, great and big, working together for a common goal or me purpose or meaning. Okay. I had bad experience <laughs> trying to create communities in schools. My children's schools, wow, was that a disaster. But anyway, um, try to be a voice, try to be a face, be a name, not just a number. That's meaningful. Don't be an anonymous number. Leave a legacy in your society, community no matter how small, you'll make the world a better place. That's what making meaning is all about. Making things better, making yourself better, making more meaning for yourself, making more meaning for others. Making meaning for others is very important because it, um, almost doubles your meaning. You get meaning out of helping the other, and the other gets meaning from you. So that's twice the meaning almost. Okay. Source of meaning number three is dialogue. Dialogue is Boober's word, my buddy Boober or a serious discussion in which you say thou to the other. Not just he, she, or it. A lot of situations we treat others as mere its. People as things, as objects. Speaking of objects. Um, <laughs> says, have serious dialogue from time to time, say thou. And I've given seven rules for conducting dialogue, but I won't go over the seven right now. Okay, a fourth source of meaning. See, so engage in dialogue in a community and with your relationships to other people. A fourth source of meaning is work. It's where we spend most of our time, our waking time by far and commuting to it and uh, all our energy, a lot of our energy goes into our work. Our work ought to be meaningful. And this is quite difficult. It's uh, hard to find jobs that are fulfilling. Stud Strickle has a great book on this. It's really a series of interviews 
of working people. It's in the book Working. It was in a play at the Goodman Theater, which I saw. Um, but the main point of Studs Terkel's book was from Chicago and had a good program for many years on WFMT, which I listened to every night. And the main point of the workers, according to Studs, and that's not a sexual reference. <laughs> that's a nickname, <clears throat> a nickname that he got from uh, liking the book Studs Lonigan was another Chicago character. So much they started calling him Studs. Uh, but the main thing the workers told Studs is they wanted to leave some sign that they were there, that they had an effect, that they built a building, that they sold things, stuff like that. That would be the most fulfilling type of work. I guess mental work is the most fulfilling. Teaching, for example, is very fulfilling. I taught over 7,000 students in my career. You might think a lot of students don't want to learn. I didn't want to learn when I was in school. <laughs> but they do. They do want to learn because they need the grades. They need the grades to get the jobs. There aren't that many jobs available to them. So it is interest. And you are helping them mature and grow the best way they can mentally. That's fulfilling work. But there's not too much of that. There's not too many of those. Ben, oh, never mind. I was going to mention Ben and Jerry's, but we haven't heard from them in a while. So, um, Okay, I'm going to talk about a fifth source of meaning now. And that is um, art. Art can be a fantastic, uh, fantastic way to make meaning. Uh, but it requires a little. And that's going to turn most people off. You know what it requires? It requires that you know a little bit about the artwork. You got to know a little bit about it and about the artist, and maybe about art too. Now I would define art myself as any matter has to be a thing, even a poem is written down, any matter that expresses something comes out of it, whether it's a book, a play, a movie, a musical, music, dance, drama, Something has to come out of it. What comes out of it? I think Suzanne Langer hit it on the head in her book, Philosophy in a New Key. Is, what comes out of art is primarily emotions and feelings that the artist has felt and he's trying to express to the audience. These emotions can range from joy and happiness, which they usually are, but they can also be about sorrow and sadness, which you find in a tragedy, which nevertheless affirms human life. But there's all kinds of emotions that could be expressed in art. These are very worth seeing. And when you're seeing them, you're just looking at them, you're just experiencing them. And um, You're not trying to use them for some purpose. You're just trying to enjoy them. Enjoy experiencing them. Because you're enjoying the feeling. The great philosopher Immanuel Kant called this being disinterested. Art is very creative. It creates new emotions, new feelings, new ideas. More new ideas have come out of art than any other field. Although that's not its main role. The main role is expressing the feelings. And now I would like to give a couple examples of that. Sorry, I don't have the illustrations. But um, one example I'm sure you all have seen is the Picasso sculpture 
untitled in Daly Plaza in downtown Chicago. It's commonly called the Chicago Picasso. What is it? It doesn't look like anything real. It looks somewhat like a woman's face, long gated with long hair. It looks like a horse's face too. Or maybe a bat. It could be many things. And that, that I think is what it's expressing, is expressing the diversity of a city like Chicago with its many cultures. It could be many things, good and bad. It's expressing their feelings. That's why it's so popular and a symbol for the city, I think. Well, that's my interpretation. You have to be able to interpret art. To interpret art, you have to know something about the artwork. And that shuts people off, turns people off. As I said, that's work. They don't want to do that. They just want to have fun, especially girls. <laughs> now I'm joking. I remember the song by Madonna, Girls Want to Have Fun. It was just fun to have fun. That was Madonna, wasn't it? Doesn't matter. Um, Cindy Lopper. Okay, thank you. I think Madonna sang in the later room. Uh, here's a little poem by her, uh, Langston Hughes, part of a poem. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Chicago and Lorraine Hansberry. Or a successful Broadway play called The Rangers in the Sun. From this poem, she took that title. Does it stink like a piece of rotten meat? Very powerful line there. That expresses emotions, if anything does. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it just explode? And there Langston Hughes is talking about race criticism, about racism. And how long can you defer Martin Luther King's dream? Well, King got his idea of the dream from this poem by Langston Hughes. Too, by the way. And that was very influential too, King, in the history of the US. And the last example I'm gonna recommend, oh, well, let's see, is the symphonies of Beethoven. They all have strong, powerful emotions. For example, the ninth emotion, Beethoven, very briefly, I'm skipping much, very much from Beethoven's ideas and feelings. Um, but um, in it, Beethoven is searching for God. And he calls out to God in the second movement. Third movement, God doesn't answer. He doesn't hear from God in any way. He can't hear God. So in the fourth movement, what happened? There's an ode to joy, a triumph of the human spirit. That even if there's no God, there's a lot of joy in art and in the human spirit trying, trying to know and feel things. That's the ninth symphony of Beethoven expresses many valuable feelings, powerful, dynamic, lyrical outcries of the human heart and spirit, just like his fifth symphony. That's another affirmation of the human spirit, which is escaping me right now. I'm sorry what that was about. Um, The feelings expressed there are joy too, for sure. Mm -hmm. Beethoven. <clears throat> Go see the Cezanne show at the Art Institute. It's big, huge, and it's all Cezanne's periods, like his fruits and his portraits. Cezanne changed the way we look at things, and the way artists look at things. He changed the colors that artists were using. They were using very drab colors. He gave very bright gay colors. He changed the forms of things. They no longer had clear outlines. They had blurry shapes. They were just impressions. 
that's kind of how we might look at things. Artists change the way of looking at things. They look at things differently. They see them differently. And that's what the arts are trying to do, to get us to experience reality differently. Often it's small, but that can be a lot. Well, so why don't you turn me down? Hmm. You need help, Bob. You need help. No, I didn't know you need help, Michael. Please be quiet. If anyone needs help. There's a painting by George Pierre Renoir at the uh, Art Institute. It's called A Dance in the Country. There's just two couples embraced in a dance, and you can tell it's full of love. What's it called, Bob? Uh, Dance in the Country. Yeah, maybe you can find it, Tim. Dance in the Country at the Art Institute. It's a couple embraced in a dance. Hang on here. There's just gentle love everywhere. There's gentle love for each other, gentle love for the dance, gentle love for the country night, the summer night. This is filled with love, expressing love. Just like Edward Munch's painting, The Scream is full of horror and anxiety that Munch felt one day by a bridge, which he couldn't make, could not cross it. <clears throat> There's dance in the country. Yeah, you see how they're embracing and they're in general love with the dance, with the, um, the music, with her decorations, their clothing, the colors, a little bit of everything. Okay, and I'll stop there. Munch is a screen. Who's calling me now? Oh, gee. One of my students from 40 years ago. <laughs> he calls me now. It's one of my first students. Um, That's good. Yeah. If you want to, you want to check that call, I can show another painting, which I think is pretty good, too. No, he'll, he'll want to talk for longer than that. But show the painting, please. The one uh, that I like a lot? I have oh, to... the screen, too. Can you get the screen? You yeah, can go I... while I'm talking. Which, okay, Bob, which one did you want? You want, it, want me to show the last one we had up or another one? Uh, the Scream by Munch. Edward Munch. Uh, it's not okay. in the Art Institute. The Scream? Yeah, okay. the Scream. The Scream yeah. with an M. How do you spell, how do you, Edward Munch? Uh, Hang on, I'm getting it now. Hi, Vicky. No, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it up now for you here real quick. And bear with me, please. Okay. Another painting at the Art Institute that expresses emotions profoundly. A lot of you have seen, huh? except for Michael, Sorry. is Edward Hopper's Nighthawks. Hang on, let me get this. They're sitting in a CD bar at night in New York City or some city, and it's dark and desolate, and there's diners in a diner, and, but they're all separate from each other. They're not interacting. Except maybe the hooker. That's, and, uh, all right, the that's, a, that's the screen from Edward Munch. Okay, what's the next one? What's the next one you wanted me to show? Nighthawks by Edward Hopper. What is it called? Nighthawks. Okay, Nighthawks. Yeah, the screen you see, uh, Munch's anxiety is expressed. That's a negative emotion, definitely negative. But a lot of people... You know, I'm just fascinated by that pain that he could express himself so fully. And it's moments that I think everyone has felt at some time in their life. So I'm, too I'm, afraid I'm, to do so. I'm getting, it. I'm getting it up now, Bob. Hang on a second, okay? Um, sorry about all, sorry about all the trouble here, but it won't take me long. I appreciate you showing them. Just give me a second, please. The goal of um, okay, here we go. Meaning as art is to find beauty. Beauty is maybe the highest of all values. Plato thought so. Okay, hang on, he I'm going to show you. Ethical goodness. It's higher than being good. Is to be beautiful, because when you're beautiful, something has beauty. It it has um, good. It captures the good for us to look at. Now this is not a negative one though. You recall seeing uh, 
restaurants like that in Chicago. I certainly do. And, well, anyway, uh, okay. Uh, want me to share another one, Bob? No, I guess that's it. You see how the, the restaurant you know, is cutting into the dark night. It has a lot of fluorescent lights shining outward. See how the lights in the front of the restaurant mm -hmm. are cutting yeah. into the dark night. But it's a harsh glaring fluorescent light. It's not pretty. It's not pretty, but, but Hopper is showing us here something very real, the loneliness that we all feel in the cities, the isolation, even when we're together, we're apart. Except for the hooker and the FBI guy. <laughs> they okay. might be in the room. All right. You, you want me to take it off the screen now, Bob? Okay. Yeah, I'm done with it. All right. Okay, so we're trying to find beauty in our... We're trying to find goodness captured for us. Or anything that we could think about, anything that fascinates us, any new great feeling. Plato defined beauty as proper proportions of the good. And we could see this in different things. Oh, he's calling me back up. Just a second, I'm sorry, one minute. Frank, I can't talk now. Can I talk to you tomorrow? Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Bye. Sorry. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay. Thank you for the indulgence. Um, it's persistent, wasn't it? We're looking for beauty. Like, for example, oh, Tim, can you show David by Michelangelo, the sculpture David by uh, Michelangelo? Yeah, hang on. David by Michelangelo? Mm-hmm, it's a sculpture. Okay. This has the perfect proportions, the balances, the harmonies, the ratios, and captures something moment. good for us to look at forever. This is true beauty. Although modern art doesn't aim for beauty, you know what it aims for? Meaning, it tries to create meanings, new meanings. Unfortunately, a lot of modern art doesn't have any meaning. You know, it's just abstract shapes and designs. It's different. Okay, there's my right. in the flesh. There's nothing hidden there. <laughs> oh, Michelangelo is pretty brave, too. He was gay, too. But anyway, see, um, David's about to slay the giant Goliath. He's going to kill the Hebrews. <laughs> going to slaughter them all, but David's got a slingshot over his shoulder now, <clears throat> and he's gazing at the giant Goliath. He's a young boy, but he's just calmly sizing it up and saying, oh, well, God, help me kill this guy. Help me get him, free my people. And you see, he's got a big hands to do that. See how giant his hand is? He's small elsewhere, though. <laughs> but, uh, I couldn't help. I couldn't hold that. Excuse me. I'm putting my bad taste there. Okay. I don't think got it anyway. <laughs> All right. So, uh, okay. I'm going to stop sharing on him now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead and keep going. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to, uh, no, no. I appreciate it very much, Tim. We now know what I'm talking about. <laughs> got an idea. Well, that helps. Or if you could, one last one Starry Night by Van Gogh. Starry Night by Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh. Okay, hang on. I'm getting yeah, a song by Don McLean called Starry, Starry Night. Okay. A lot of you are going to remember it and uh, can see it in this painting. And then I'll go to the next source of meaning, the sixth one. God. And we could spend all mm -hmm. night on that easily. But I'll spare you. I'll go over the main points of God. This God could be the most important meaning. If God truly exists, he's obviously the most important meaning. But it is a starry night. And Van Gogh's looking outside of his um, uh, asylum where he voluntarily committed himself. And he sees a starry night. He sees this, this night sky alive. 
the divine presence. Today we won't see all those stars. We won't see any stars. We just see pollution. But Van Gogh saw God's presence in the sky and the bright stars and the shooting, shooting stars. You see the shooting stars right in the middle? The bright glowing crescent moon that he liked. Very bright. In the upper right hand corner and in the lower left hand corner. You see a flaming um, cypress tree. Cypress tree, which is common in this part of the, uh, the world, but it's like a flame trying to reach the starry night. And that's what Van Gogh saw looking out of his window one night. We couldn't do the same, but he, he could. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing on it now. Okay, yeah. So we could all enjoy the beauty that he perceived and express to us. All right, God, source number six. God, I define as the supernatural, it has to be supernatural. Pantheus says God is nature, he's everything that exists. That's not God. God is more than nature, it's higher and greater than God. God is supreme and God is the eternal being, if he exists. The God question is whether or not got a picture of God, Tim? No, I'm just joking. Just, just joking. <laughs> um, the God question is, does God exist or not? And that's about one of the biggest questions we could ask. It's second only to the meaning question. It's part of the meaning question because if God does exist and if Western religions are true about God, so, uh, we will live forever. We will live in eternity and joy with all our loved ones being there and our enemies burning forever in hell. And what could be scarier than that, burning forever in hell? So that's why the God question is so important. <clears throat> the answer is very optimistic and very flattering. If it's true, today I find a great deal of indifference to the whole question. A lot of people tend to be agnostics and the agnostics say, oh, we can't know, it's too big, can't know, can't put them in my head. So I'll just believe in them, I'm mocking them, of course. <laughs> uh, I'll just believe in them if God does exist. I'll, uh, I'll go to heaven forever and he'll let me live forever heaven because I believe in them. Well, I try to believe in them, and I would if I could, but I can't know them. Well, that's a bunch of hogwash. They're copying out. They're trying to take the easy way out, which children often do, which gets you nowhere. You know, if, if there is a God, he's not going to be happy with those people at all. He's going to be very dissatisfied. He'll send them straight to hell because they didn't try. They're just trying to get in. A good deal for nothing, a great deal. Immortal happiness for nothing. Fair chance they're going to get it if there is a God. But there is a question whether there's a God. There's a big question. It's a huge question, enormous. The biggest one of all after meaning, I guess. As I said, a lot of people take the way of blind faith and they believe in God because they want to go to heaven. They don't want to die. They believe the Bible. The Bible is very weak historically. It does have four accounts of the life of Jesus resurrecting four of them. That's a lot when you get in them at four, four different writers at four different times, four different places, very, very far apart with no way of communicating. Um, my son is joining me. No, I'm not joining anything. Oh, I beat him. Who, what are you doing? Who are you talking to? Skidoo, please. Can't you get him? No. What did you need, Bob? No, I don't need, need my son to leave. <laughs> oh. Where was blind faith? A lot of people have blind faith because they want to go to heaven and be happy forever without doing anything. And they believe the Bible, but the Bible is pretty weak historically, too. Go on. Well, there might be some grounds, but it take a lot of study to believe in it is historically true. All the other religions claim they have the like. 
We have much better historical proof, much simpler. So what are we to do? We try to find a rational faith, a faith that's based on reason, that's reasonable. It's based on evidence and grounds for believing that. Did you ever feed the dogs? Oh, the yes. All right. And uh, then he hid the candies from me. There's um, three main arguments for God's existence, which I would just name because it takes way too long to summarize them. And well, one of them is the argument from the creator called the cosmological argument. And this argument holds that. It's, Dave, you can stand here if you want. This argument holds that. Can I have some of those cherry candies? Well, what do I want to be in there for? You listen to me. I don't even have cherries for it. Um, um, the cosmic creator argument just simply says the universe has to have a creator. Couldn't the whole universe always have existed? Um, no, says this argument, says it has to be cause, everything has a cause. There has to be a first cause of the, of the whole universe. It has to have a cause. And you know what scientists have found through the Higgs boson and the like that uh, the universe does have a definite beginning 13.4 billion years ago, something seven, I'm sorry, 13.7 billion years ago has a definite beginning, but there's other universes though. There's billions of other universes. They discovered that with the Hubble telescope recently. <clears throat> so that complicates the matter a good deal. But it's a, a strong argument for God nonetheless, I say. Second argument for God is the design argument or the cre uh, planner argument that there has to be a divine planner to the universe. And the universe uh, so well, works together so well in all its details, I don't have time to go into them. You know, how could something like humans emerge out of, evolve, as a main criticism of design from nature? Well, that was a problem, but the, the earth seems more, finely tuned than evolution can allow for. And the last argument for God's existence is that um, millions of people have expressed their belief that they have experienced God, millions and millions, whereas every single one of them deluded. It only takes one. How about Moses? Did Moses talk to God? led them to uh, lead the Jews out of Egypt and perform any miracles. You don't have to believe in the miracles. But something must have inspired Moses. There's millions of others. In the Far East, this is taken very seriously. And many people today, even in our materialistic age, many people um, practice yoga of an advanced type, not just the body type, you could do it at your park or something. But there's a mental yoga word in which you can experience God, like Buddha did. And many people today claim they experience God. It's their God, but still God. And mental yoga. Are they all wrong? Are they all tricking themselves, deceiving themselves, deluded? You only need one, one case of an authentic mystical experience to make it a good proof for God's existence. Okay, so creator, planner, mystic arguments for God. None are fully conclusive, but they might lead to a rational faith. And there's a big problem against God's existence, and that's evil, the tremendous amount of evil. Question?
there's a tremendous the main argument against God's existence is there's a tremendous amount of evil in, in the world. No good God would allow so much evil as brothers killing brothers like Cain and Abel did. Cain killed Abel because he was jealous. He was jealous of him. Abel found pleasure in God and Cain did not. So Cain just killed him, murdered him. How would God allow this? There's many worse evil. What about World War II? And one. And the million, thousands and thousands of stupid wars we've had. And many innocent young men are slaughtered. How could God allow this? Why didn't he reveal himself to us? Well, the main answer to that throughout history has been that God allows so much evil because God is thereby allowing us to be free, be free to do what we want, to be free to choose good or evil. If we choose good, we go to heaven forever and are happy with our family and friends forever. But if you choose evil, you burn forever with all your enemies. So that'll scare you. <laughs> oh. My own answer is God cannot conquer all evil. I think God is limited. God is finite and evolving and needs help in the battle against evil. Okay, well, that's God in a nutshell. And I've sought God every day of my life for the last 50, 60 years. Make it almost 60. Half hour every day. I take one day of rest on Sunday because if God could do it, I could do it too. Okay. But I try to read and talk, watch TV. There's a Catholic channel on TV. There's tapes on it. I've done any of those sort of things. All right. And now, moving right along, I go to... Um, Questions next, or are you done? No, I got a little more to go. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. And next one's a big one. It's material possessions. Where do they come in? Aren't they meaningful? Sure, they, are. they have meaning. A lot of people work hard all their lives to buy possessions. That's where they spend most of their time at work. You know, it's trying to make money. A lot of them don't care about the job. They want the money to buy stuff that they need. They need it to survive. And that's all it's going to do for them, too. It's going to help them survive. Why the hell you want to survive? Just to struggle some more to buy more junk? That's what it turns into. It turns into junk and garbage in a few years. You're not even that happy with it once you get it. Studies today show that um, the average purse is no matter how big, we're done being happy about it an hour later. <laughs> so we gotta keep on buying stuff, buying things. You keep on being happy and it's never ending, it's never satisfying, it's never fulfilling. We're always enslaved to it. We're in slavery to our possessions. If that's your source of meaning. And it is for many people. That's all they got. They're in some bad relationships. Well, if they're lucky, they have good ones. If they met the right people, we're lucky. Or, or you could work at it too. Be in a dirty dating service. <laughs> To uh, materialism, though, is the enemy of making meaning because it appeals to so many people. That's the only meaning. That's why I think Charlie put it in his second announcement. It is a big theme in my writings that he's read. He read my journal a lot and went to my talks. I have Seekers Dialogues talk every month. The next one I think is uh, July 24th, I think it is. It's gonna be my beautiful backyard and we're gonna talk about ideas from my last book on my life making meaning. If you read your book, you'll feel sorry for the, uh, your heart will go off for poor young Bob. <laughs> Oh, I said June 24th, June 24th will be the next Seekers Dialogue. If you'd like to attend, please contact me. 
<clears throat> my yard will be full of flowers by then. Uh, free pizza and pop and that kind of stuff. You won't have to pay me to come in person, meet real people and talk to real people and it won't be Zoomed. Which is phony. A degree of phoniness. Better than nothing by far for sure. Okay, uh, let's see. Art, God, boy, big topics. I try to get to the core. All right, I think the last one that up. The last one, number eight. Let's try to wrap it up in about ten minutes, okay? Yeah, I should be able to do that. The last one's the hardest one. And I called it intangible, so maybe that's not a good word. Maybe they should be called non-tangibles. Uh, but, but an intangible, I define those as an immaterial reality, something that's not physical, but it's real nonetheless. You know, because it has power and effects. Examples of intangibles are truth, deep truths, not, not everyday nickel and dime truths, deep truths, God, goodness, justice, beauty, the self, free will, ideas, reason, language, love, peace, and last but most, meaning are intangibles. These are real, but they're not physical. And we need to try to know intangible truths individual ones can't know the whole intangible way too much for a puny human minds and our minds are really puny try and think of more than five ideas at a time five simple things i went to the store to buy a loaf of bread and i'm stopped with this simple idiotic i can't go any further than that that's how limited the human mind is very although we can kind of know infinity we can have a vague idea of what infinity is but we're trying to know intangible truths. Like maybe an ethical one, I'll give you an example. All people have intrinsic value, all people have value. That's an example of an intrinsic, uh, <clears throat> intrinsic truth. I think Immanuel Kant, again, the great uh, aesthetician, he, in his critique of pure reason, no, it was pure practical reason, excuse me. Pure reason was about knowledge. Practical reason was about ethics. He, he decided that a good action, and this is an intrinsic, an intrinsic truth, intangible truth, sorry. A good action is one that we are willing to do to anyone, inclu including ourselves. And I have a list of them, these in my, my, my book, Making Meaning. But they're hard to come by, these intangible truths. Definitely. I have some for free will, some for beauty. It's about it. That I know. And in my book, Making Meaning, I give six arguments for the existence of intangibles. I'll just mention these. There's higher levels of existence. Human consciousness is not tangible. You can think, but your thinking is not a thing. Is it connected to your brain? Well, psychologists have been trying to prove it was for decades now, and they can't do it. Intangible truths give us greater knowledge. I can't go into that. Our knowing is partially intangible. Here's one from Michael Kazanjan. We have intangible constraints on our behavior. This is from Kant, though, too. Yeah, we have obligations to do good and duties to refrain from hurting other people. It's just wrong. We're constrained or obligated to do good and avoid evil. And my last sixth argument 
for uh, intangibles is that they exist, they abound actually, they abound in current physics. I asked Doug Binkley, I'll talk to your off about that. Is Doug there now? Um, Doug? He was here, I, yeah, he's here. Doug Binkley's still here. Hey Doug, can you name some intangibles in physics? Just name them, please. He's muted and I think he's paying attention, but you know, he's still here. Uh, okay, well, we wouldn't understand them anyway. The things well, like I'm sorry that button wasn't working. I am here. Um, I know several times we discussed this, Bob, and um, I provided some analogies to it intangibles like neutrinos, uh, yeah. which uh, go through our bodies every day. Like you, you might have as many as a billion going through you every every second, but uh, you can't feel them. They don't interact. So they're yeah. they're essentially like your intangible uh, idea. Uh, there are a few other things I I threw out. Um, and amongst them are these intangible ideas of physics, you know, like energy. We don't even really know exactly what it is. It's just a bookkeeping thing, but it's a it's a great idea on the um, on the uh, level of the ideas that you presented as being intangible ideas, uh, whether they're, they're abstract kind of abstract maybe is, a, is another kind of word for what you're talking about. All right, thanks, Doug. Scientists have given Nobel prizes for these discoveries like neutrinos and the Higgs boson, I think was the latest one, Nobel Prize in 2012 in science. Yeah, the um, Higgs field is certainly intangible. Yeah. <laughs> it's, an, it's an intangible, but it, it does have an effect, but the, the field itself, you can't, you can't feel it. Um, right. And that's what intangible is. You can't feel it, touch it, measure it, but it's real. We think something has to be physical to be real. But um, there's a lot of intangibles in nature and in the universe. So what more proof could you ask for than physical proof that we, we got it, that intangibles do exist. And we're just prejudiced towards physical things because they're much easier to see and measure and touch and taste. <laughs> we live mostly for intangibles. Would a man work if he was humiliated at work, if he made a lot of money? No. No, we live for goodness. We live for justice. We live for freedom. And deep truths. Um, I'm pretty near the end now, I guess. Um, that's the last source. We can know an intangible by intuitive knowledge, by deep thinking. And um, then you get a flash of insight, hopefully, into the truth. And these truths have power, like Gandhi was able to use intangible to harness the whole nation of India to free it from British colonialization. And that's an example of how we live for, for intangibles and how they have power. And I hope you're not overwhelmed by all this. It's a lot, a lot of information, a lot of heavy stuff, important stuff. What matters most, I say, is making meaning. So go out and make meaning, make all the meaning, especially for other people. Make meaning for yourself by making a community, by uh, enjoying art, go see Cezanne, learn about that great artist. Things like that you can make meaning, but most of all, make meaning for others. Help others satisfy their needs, not their wants. You can never satisfy a want. You always want more. If they have genuine need for food, then give them food. Or coupons to buy food, you can buy them at McDonald's and give them to a panhandler. Oh, I was going to give you dog tips. Charlie mentioned I was going to give tips. I got a bunch of tips, but I guess my time is up. Uh, go on for a couple of more minutes and share those tips. Okay, I'll just shoot out a bunch of tips to you. <clears throat> this I got the idea from John Anderson in his Tribune article on my journal. 
he put together a series of 10 tips. I had them right on my wall right up here. <laughs> and my dad, I framed them. He got 10 tips out of reading my journal, the issues that I gave him. And I hadn't put them as tips, but he put them that way. And I said, hey, that's a good idea, John. I'll give a bunch of tips too. So here's some tips. And like the biggest tip I got, it was in my intro philosophy course, <clears throat> which I taught the most of. No, I think I taught ethics the most, but um, my biggest tip is to connect with something bigger than yourself to make meaning. Connect with a social cause that's just, connect with other people, something like that, something bigger than yourself. Like the college of complexes is an excellent way. And you'll make meaning that way. I'll also in my, every course I taught for the first exercise in the journals, first one, number one, was to write your own epitaph that you write you want your life to mean. What do you want your life to mean when you when they bury you? If you are going to be buried, most people won't, of course, but because they don't want to be food for worms. <laughs> In a, wooden, in a wooden casket, but uh, <clears throat> write what you want people to remember about you. Write what you want your life to stand for on your gravestone. Or just write it, just write it. All right, some other handy tips. Um, well, help others. Um, live as fully as you can, as deeply as you can. We don't give much money, much time, seize every moment. Always make your meanings as broad as they can be, as big as they can be, as ethical to as many people, but also make them very specific so they could apply to daily life. Best way to know something is have it be emotional, associated with emotions, like you learned something big, or you learned something different, or you learned it at a certain time. Another tip is to decorate your house with paintings that are meaningful to you for events or colors of the painter, what they depict. I have a load of them on my desk here and many paintings from the Art Institute miniatures, my favorites from the Art Institute. And it's like going to the Art Institute, which is an awesome place, totally awesome, best museum in the US, one travel magazine voted. And I agree. Oh, I haven't seen them all. Vary your routines as much as you can is another tip. Um, give a little time to other friendships like I didn't do to my friend tonight. I'm glad he understood. Contact your friends on their birthdays. Make the world a little better every day by doing something little every day. Like I've picked up litter for the past 50 years and deposited it usually not far, but that makes the world, makes society a little better. We usually make it a little worse. We usually take away stuff for us to live. We take a lot away. You can make it a little better though. Try and do that every day. And I guess the last tip, I'll have is uh, don't be like dust in the wind, as Ecclesiastes says in the Bible, dust in the wind. But um, savor the taste of food. Just let it dwell on each delicious taste you bite. Keep it in your mouth as long as you can if you don't look too conspicuous. And get more pleasure, prolonged pleasure. It's one of the greatest pleasures on earth after seeing. And hearing, I think taste comes in number three. To try and prolong it. And eat good food, health, but healthy. And, and the healthy food becomes good tasting to you after a while, I found out. So that's enough tips for right now. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for listening so long. And again, I hope I haven't overwhelmed everyone. With oh, well, no, we're going to make a good transition because I think one of the best pictures for making meaning is something just like this. Tim, please, let's go to questions. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. All right. Anyway, Thank you. 
Let's go to questions. So who's got a question uh, for Bob Lichtenberg? Um, please. I have one. I have one. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, I don't know if we got to take um, mm -hmm. names down, but if you can raise your hands, otherwise. All right. So who was Kel Kelvin first? And then Ellen. Then Ellen. And who else? So we got hey, Tim, run a good image of making me show the cover of my book. I'll show you again. I'll show it again for you. Okay, give me a minute, please. It's very symbolic, though. It's symbolic. You're making meaning. Give me a minute, Bob. I'll have to pull it up, okay? Well, you could run on with questions, but... Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm getting it. I, it's it's going to take me a minute. i got to remember how to spell your last name. L-I-C-H-T-E-N. B E R T as in telephone. Okay, I will get it here in a minute. Uh, no G. No, no, no. I'm, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get that cover up in just a second for you. Okay. And hang I mean, on. You can get it on my website, BobLichtenberg.org. No, 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 I'm not. I'm, I've I've got it up on the uh, Amazon link here. So just give me a second while I pull it up for you. Give me a minute here and I will have, I'll share the screen in just a second. Give me a minute. Okay, Bob, there's your uh, book. Is that what you wanted to see? Can you tell the bottom part? You got the top part. You got the small version of the, of the top version of the big one. You need the bottom one of the big one. Okay, give me a minute here. Give me a minute. Right there, correct? Yeah, it's not as big now, but it's that's the whole thing. But I'll get another image up if you want. Bear with me, I'll get another image up. Okay. All right, give me a second, Bob. I'll pull it up in just a second here. Give me a second, I'll have to find it here. Um, a bunch of serene symbols and their computer graphics that all that's all I had available. No, I got I just, okay, here, here we go. Here oh, we go. Doug's friend made a hand-drawn version, I think. Oh, it was computer, but it was good. I'm, I'm pulling it up. Let's go on this one. Just bear with me. I'm getting it. Getting your website up now, Bob. Okay. okay. <clears throat> and at the trees, the stream, and the waterfall, well, and the okay. azure, blue sky, they all refresh us. And seeking meaning does. Okay, hang and on. our relationships with others can. Pulling up your website now, Bob. Hang on a second. Having You're trouble. seeing there a steep hill. Give me a minute. Give me steep a minute. hill symbolizes the intangibles that we cannot see the top or touch or feel. <clears throat> right there, or is it? Uh... That's the wrong book. Right, right there. Is, yeah. Why don't you leave it with that one? Leave it there. The middle one. I'm talking about the middle one. No. This one that we just had. Mm -hmm. Okay, hang on. I'll find I'll find it. I'll, I'll, I'll okay, find leave it. that to me. I don't know if you can enlarge it. Um, give me a second. I'll enlarge it a little bit. Hang on. I'm going to take just a second here. Take just a second. Will you go on the questions? Well, let me just say this, and then we can. We have a copy links on the website, College Complexes for July or June. Okay. Add a copy of the book cover. There we go, Bob. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, there we go. Oh, uh, okay. There's supposed to be a deep blue sky. It doesn't come out too, too clearly there, but anyhow. The mountains symbolize intangibles that we cannot see, see, but we know they're real. And we need to mount them, and it's difficult, it's very difficult. Unlike the stream and the trees and the waterfall, soothe us when we make meaning, we feel great joy. And the bright sun symbolizes the ultimate source of life <clears throat> and hence of meaning. Perhaps God, it did for Plato in his famous allegory of the cave. A prisoner scrambles out of the cave 
which represents the earth. And he gets out because he wants to see if there's more outside the cave. And he does, and the last thing he sees outside the cave is a bright blinding sun. He can't look directly at it without being blinded. That's Plato's symbol for God, and the biggest meaning of all. But, uh, but uh, you know, it, uh, we're not sure if it's real or not, though. We always have to keep questioning that. And uh, the whole image is balanced. It's beautiful. And maybe that's the greatest meaning, is this balance and harmony that we need in our actions, like Plato said and Aristotle. OK, thanks, Tim. All right. Uh, are, you, are you done now, Bob? Mm -hmm. OK, so I had Kelvin, I had Ellen Corley, and then I have Bob Matter. Anybody else? OK, Kelvin, go ahead first. Okay, um, I'd like to um, take particular issue in your um, proof of God's existence. And I'd like to ask you, do you not think you've made a major theological error that most the theists do? In the fact that, okay, there is arguments for and against um, an ex and a creator and an existence of God. Um, and you can come to that conclusion, which all of, all of pretty much all of your arguments were about. But there is a huge leap from saying there may or may not have been a, a, a creator. Firstly, um, does that creator have any interest in the universe that they, that they created? I, I could, you know, that's, I mean, I, I'm, I've been a carpenter all my life. Do you really think I care about the stuff I've made years ago? It's nice to see it's still there, but yeah, you know. Right? Um, but there's a huge leap from saying there may be, a, that there's a God. Just saying, they, he imparted all this wisdom to a bunch of illiterate goat herders in the middle of the deserts that told you what to eat, what to wear, who to have sex with, and in which hole. And you had to praise him constantly because he's that, that much of a narcissist. And so you, you, you end up with um, some oppressive uh, North Korean type of existence where you have to worship this entity and and if you do not measure up then you're going to get punished right? there's a whole hell waiting for you for not being the great person that this creator should be which is and there's a difference between north korea and the oppression of religion which let's get let's say that most people the, the, the most theists base their uh truths upon the religion that they were brought up with uh, which they, they expose, which is as arbitrary as which sports team you, you support. It's geographical and cultural. So yeah, um, uh, do, do you not think there's a, there's, a, there's a huge leap from there being a possibly a God or a creator to using the Bible as his word? Because... Oh, yeah, the Bible very much, yeah. Well, there is fair amount of historical evidence for the Bible, but that's, that's the one big confusion atheists make. They confuse religions with philosophy or theology or the study of God with the practice of God in the various religions. Those religions have nothing to do with the existence of God, really. They start out with faith in God. They believe in God to begin with. So, so it's not even a question to them. They don't even get into it. Mm. And most people are raised in these throughout yes, the world. But, yeah, but yes, but the, the, the arguments you're giving for God are written in books, which were the, the judo, the, the, the no, Jewish no. religion for a start, right? Yeah, you know, and, then, and, and, that, and then the Christian religion afterwards, and perhaps even the uh, Islam after that. And who knows, maybe even that Book of Mormon, because they all, because every one of you say you've got the truth. They're wrong. They're all wrong. Even Christianity is all wrong. You know, I, I have a lot of problems with the way the New Testament was edited by the popes or by councils by the popes. They're only going to put in things that they agree with, leave out the stuff they do not. 
that started way in the history of the church. So no, never confuse a religion with an argument for God. They don't give arguments for God. But they even if there is a God, God and, and, he's, and he's powerless to act, then what difference does it make? Uh, there are arguments for God. There's several strong ones. Yeah, but what difference does it make? If, if God is powerless to act, what difference does it make his existence or not? Uh, that's a further question. Uh, if God does exist, um, he should have the power to act. That's another complicated question. Yeah. It's like the lucky pen I use sometimes when you tap on the lottery by once every three years. It's, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. What well, works? Okay, it? Oh. Well, then I actually want to continue this. Next question, please. All right. Yes. All right. Um, Who's yes. next? Uh, okay, I want to go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so many questions, but um, thanks. And Good. You know, um, I guess one is, what do you, what I've learned, I, I love Plato and Socrates and applied philosophy, and, but only in my later age do I, am I seeing, you know, philosophy in context and worried that there is a Luciferian force that's taking over the world and, uh, uh, you know, uh, through technology, it's kind of, it's nihilism, really kind of the opposite of making meaning and objectivism of Ayn Rand versus subjectivism. But I'm just wondering, you know, how, as a philosopher and uh, in this world of philosophers, is there debate, you know? Um, I mean, is there an opportunity to um, kind of bring what's, I think you have more of a subjective view towards to try to like, bring down this abysm, <laughs> which is like fascism and Nazism. Um, so, I was wondering what you think about evil and um, political tyranny, uh, philosophically. Do philosophers debate it? Yeah. Oh, sure, sure, all the time, that's all they do. <laughs> We just had a big conference downtown Chicago and Central Division American Philosophical Association at the Palmer House. We took up three floors of the Palmer House for four days, giving papers and talks, mostly, almost entirely debating all these issues. You know, not so much God. God wasn't a big one on there, very small. Do, do you, but do you, no. There was nothing on meaning <clears throat> except. Um, no, adopting yeah. this year. Is your, yeah, is your views, um, it sounds kind of emotional and fuzzy. <laughs> I mean, do you, do you find um, yourself being criticized or, uh, you know, you're in this school versus logical positivism? Or I'm, I'm kind of, I'm surprised you seem to be tangling with um, uh, our other philosopher here, the unified theory of philosophy. How, how is your theories different? Um, you know, from, uh, you know, what are the debates, I guess, in philosophy, I mean, that are current now in the American Philosophical Conference? I'm uh, not too much up to date on those since I retired almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I, don't that much. I don't subscribe to their journals. They're a good cure for insomnia, even the titles, you know. So, yeah. Uh, Right. That, I think that's maybe the effect of PhD. You know, yeah. you have to say something different and unique. And, and so it, it's sad that there's not more philosophy in schools and, and culture, uh, conversation, movies, I don't, even high school, right? Um, do they teach it in high school? I think it's a real basic discipline that uh, we're that maybe it's, there could be a war on it, really, trying to dumb us down. I'm not sure, I'm not up close to that, but I'm pretty sure that no, it's rarely taught in high school, only the best high schools and only to one class per year. Like in Evanston High School, 
they have one class in philosophy every year and they got thousands of bright students, you know. Mm -hmm. That's how they can handle. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. That's how. Yeah. Um, it's just yeah, it's, the debates are ignored by people. Right. And, and even in religion, there's different theories and philosophies implicit. And do you debate? I mean, do you feel like there's been an evolution of thought in between Catholics and Protestant, maybe a, more of an interfaith kind of, you know, Islam together with Christianity um, in terms of philosophy? You know. Try to form a culture, multicultural, a little bit, and take yeah. another faiths like Islam. Not much Buddhist, not much Hindu, very little of those. But again, I've been away from it for a while. I don't think it's any different. Well, what I saw down at the Palmer House in February, it's pretty much the same. Not what much. about you know this idea of making it seem that? Um, like critical race theory is bad or or that, you know, Muslim, Islamic fascism or, I, I hate the way that, you know, we make enemies out of Russia bad, you know, Ukraine good. How how can philosophy, how, what do you, you know, how they're dividing and conquering us. And I, it just, it's so upsetting to me, you know, and I, I, I used to have comfort in, you know, good, you know, God, love, meaning, art, beauty. But now I see the divisions and it, uh, I despair. I guess like that existential, you know, um, picture you described, you know, that, uh, but the good news is that you can always make meaning. So um, anyhow, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I'll move, let, uh, let but, up. Now that's not significant. You say you used to make meaning, but now you can't do it anymore. You used to make oh. meaning in different areas and now you can't do it like art. Oh. I make meaning out of out of the bad. I, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to wage a legal battle to get the courts to be more just. You know, um, I feel like that's what I liked about Socrates is he the apology and his ability to argue um, calmly <laughs> with those who are making him take poison. You know. Um, the evil forces around us, uh, you know, uh, I, I, the man's in humanity, man. How can we, you know, I guess the great philosophers speak to it and um, and we turn to them like you do, you know, um, Richard Rorty, you know, um, I just, every, I, the ones you mentioned, I'm gonna read more of it. I, I think they're deeply subjective and um, the good spirit of God and Christianity versus the the interpretation like, you know, um, overturn Roy versus Wade because, because uh, evil Catholic popes, you know, proclaim it. <laughs> That's what concerns me. And also I, what I like is epistemology, this idea that we got from Jim Festus, who is a philosopher also. Um, and he, he talked about not just inductive, deductive, but adductive, you know, like we have to be able to logically um like uh poke holes and arguments of those who are taking over our world and killing us off with their okay. killing vaccines uh, Ellen, i'd like to move on bob matters got the next question go ahead bob <clears throat> yeah bob um do you think that uh um abortion if by outlawing abortion do you think that would give more meaning to life um do you think that uh um well let's just just go with that one for right now well in general that would be very hard to say um you need a specific case um well what you do in a case like abortion with the method of meaning that I propose, as you look and see what effects, long-term effects it has for all people and how, how much the quality of a person's life will um, be affected by a decision, 
that, that determines whether it's ethical or not. You know, <clears throat> what's, um, what the impact is on all those involved in the decision. Mm -hmm. and I would say though, in the vast majority of abortions, the impact would be beneficial. There's nothing sacred about a fetus. The fetus is not even aware. It's not human except in a biological sense, and that doesn't matter much. It doesn't. No, the biological sense of humans doesn't. So at what point at what point does a human life uh at what time at what point does a human life um have have meaning or is worthy of meaning or well, meaning well, well, I mean, it would be much later and after conception they have to have consciousness <clears throat> and have to be thinking consciousness huh? But I'm so, not consciousness. consciousness. So, yeah, three months, four months, whatever. Three three months. I mean, is that three months after they're born, or three months before they're born, or what? Three months what, after conception. So, what point does a life have meaning or value? I'm not sure if they're the same thing. Uh, first, you have, first, you have to discern whether it's life as we know it, Jim. Right. So uh, where most of this uh, uh, falls down to is, is it sustainable outside of the womb, right? Well, in the United States, uh, uh, until very recently, it was illegal to kill a bald eagle. Federal fence? Yes. A bald eagle, to kill a bald eagle. They were on the endangered species list. Uh, you know, and they had, they were had been affected by the the DDT uh, chemical uh, you know years ago, and uh, and it greatly if you know affected them. So uh, they were on the uh, endangered species list. You could not kill an eagle, but you could also not kill an eagle egg. You could also not yeah. you know break an eagle egg or steal an eagle egg out of the nest either. Yeah. Uh, um, so. The, at that well, point, so that tells us that a that an unborn eagle was just as valuable, or just had just as much value and meaning as an adult bald eagle. No, no, no. Excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me. That's um, that's that's a spurious argument. What's that? That's a spurious argument. Yeah. When because did um, because when did the human you're, race because, become endangered? Because you're, not, because you're not forcing another human being to sit on that bloody eagle's uh, egg into the hatches. You know, you're not forcing the, that bald eagle to hatch the egg. Well, we're talking about uh, the life, you know, that life of that eagle. It's not hatched. It's not, 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 it could be a one day old. It could be one, you know, that yeah, egg. Could it's, be, not your, it's not your call. One okay. minute. Okay, I'll give, I'll, I'll give you an example, right? There's an eight-year-old child and he needs a bone marrow transplant. And guess what? You are the only person in the world that's a match to that child. Now, of course, you're a good, good human being. You would volunteer your services. You would you would have the bone marrow transplant, I'm assuming. But should the state have the right to force you to? Well, according to our Constitution, yes, because the Constitution is to protect life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. No, 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 and at no, that no, point, no, no, life it doesn't mention zygote. No, life, 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 life is part of it. The cells are the cells of the, the cells of uh, that. Yeah, exactly. The, at this point now, new sperm life is, is sacred. Huh? We're getting way off the point. We're going way off the point. Well, when there's what's the next question, please? Go on. Okay. Uh, Charles, uh, you got the next question. And then our Six, huh? uh, 847 Jake. Yeah. Hi. All right. All right. So Charles and then Jake. So Charlie, go ahead. Yeah. I, uh, I was really surprised to learn that because new, because neutrinos can pass through an object that this is some new form of existence. I don't know what you'd call it. It's outside the realm of particle physics. I mean, 
sunlight passes through objects that are transparent, such as glass. And I don't know if you'd call sunlight an intangible. Um, no. no. I would say that, I, are you theorizing some new form of existence outside of Newtonian physics? And uh, yes, but I'm not doing it. Our, Prize winning scientists are doing it. No, I, I think uh, Bob is mainly concerned with the field of ideas. It, doesn't it? Well, all they need is a better microscope and as they have in, with other things. But you can't say that there's a third form of existence. Are you saying that particle nucleo nucleus, the part of, parts of a nucleus are like human thought? That it doesn't, doesn't stand up. That doesn't stand. Doug, what are you saying? I, I think Bob is, is mainly interested in the field of philosophy and abstract ideal deals and things like that. And um, I merely presented some things as analogies to what Bob was talking about. I didn't say that neutrinos were exactly like um, his category of, of what he calls intangibles. I think that uh, they might be better to call them abstract ideas, abstract ideals or no. ideas. Some, some they of them are ideas. in the world, do they not? But they, they do exist. And it is another plane. It is another kind of existence, Charlie. It's just it is. another particle, Bob, man. But, yes, it's but it's it. analogous to what Bob has presented. It's, I didn't say it was exactly. I said it was analogous. You were giving it as proof. Thank you. I, Charlie, you want to see things now? like space time also are analogous to what Bob's talking about. We, there's no substance to, to space time. It just exists. You're talking about not, the it doesn't have a it doesn't have a physical presence. It's just we we exist in it, just like we exist in perhaps um, the alternate um, uh, universe of ideas. Um, there are about 85 identified objects in space with all sorts of attributes, but they do in fact exist like you and I do. Yeah, but, but space time is actually a mathematical formulation until we actually discover if there is some kind of um, other otherness to it. <laughs> now, um, instead of getting on, I think Jake's got the next question. So, uh, Jake, yeah. go ahead and uh, ask. Yeah, you this this Hello. this question is this question is directed to Bob Matter. Uh, the, the 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 real the real issue that you're talking about is separation of church and state. Is is this a theoc or do we live in a theocracy? I don't think so. Um, Bob's still here. Yeah. Yeah, Bob, he would like us to, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's a constitutional. It's a constitutional issue, Jake. It's a it's a constitutional constitutional issue. The constitu constitution is supposed to uh, protect our lives, and that inc includes lives of the of the unborn. It doesn't say that you have to be, you know. Uh, an IQ test or or be uh three months old or some you know anything else it just it's you know supposed to uh uh you know uh Bob at the time the constitution okay. was written abortion was legal uh, I'm not done yet I'm not life done liberty yet. and yeah, pursuit of happiness and, uh, at the time, and, uh, at once the time at the, I'm not done yet at the time the constitution was was written. I don't. Th I don't think abortion existed because the technology existed. I may be wrong. Maybe there are crude oh. forms of abortion. But wait, 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 wait. I'm not done yet. Um, but is it part part of the part of the hypocrisy here is that the same same people who are in, who are who are in favor of outlawing abortion have no problem with an 18 year old who can't go into a bar and legally order a, a glass of beer because it's illegal. The bar owner could lose his liquor license from it. The same 18 year old can go into a gun shop and buy an AK 47 and go into a school, go into a classroom and start shooting up people. How is that relevant? How's that relevant? It's not. 
Well, it's, 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 rele- it's, relevant, it's relevant because these are people who are opposed to abortion because the, because oh. the, because the Bible, because the Bible says, because the Bible says thou shalt not kill. That's not relevant in the least. Why is it not relevant? Because it doesn't pertain to the point of making meaning. It has nothing to do with it. Not- well, what does that have to, what does it have to do with We're talking about making meaning here. We're not talking about abortion. Let's, let's move on, okay? Okay, all right. I have a question for Michael Kazanjan. All right, Brian. Can I ask Michael a question? Yeah, go ahead. Michael Kazanjian, are you still there? Unmute, Michael. Hold on. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Can you hear me, Michael? Yeah, Yeah, I hear, I kind of hear you, Bob, but uh, I have very bad audio here. Um, I can't hear very clearly on, on the speaker. But uh, I'll try to uh, understand you. Do you have a question for me? Yeah, it's simple. Could you please explain your crack that I need help? Could you please explain your crack that I need help? Your comment, you said I need help. Why did you say that? I, I can't, I can't hear you. I didn't think so. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, now let's move on. Brian, you got the next question, so go ahead. Brian, you got the next question on mute. So, Bob, how do you, if, if someone is searching for a purpose in life, for meaning, how can a person evaluate whether that purpose that they're seeking to fulfill is an objective good in the sense that, you know, I think sometimes people get led astray, like good ideas gone wrong, good intentions that lead yeah. to something very destructive. Like how do, how would you suggest evaluating whether the purpose you're searching <laughs> is going to achieve a, an objective good? Oh, that's an excellent question, and I don't have a very good answer for it because it's it's very difficult. Um, I think it can be done, I'll say that at the start. I'll also say I, I think it's extremely difficult, again. Um, yeah, you should try and formulate a purpose for your life as soon as you can. As young as you can, your parents ought to help you in your school ought to. Your schools do nothing about this. Schools are vocational training centers. That's all they are in the US and you have to find your way around that. If you want to make meaning other than making money. Um, you have to go on your own path and just try and know as much as you can about objective reality. Not of the scientific variety so much, but um, I don't know, moral principles, philosophical ones, social social needs. You have to try and meet the needs of other people, not their wants, and try and find out what those needs are and how you can best meet those needs. It's a a very difficult job, certainly not easy. Thank you. So you. That's the right path, though, I think. Hey, um, Entirely, although it's extremely hard, like I said. Dan, Take Dan, Dan, soul searching and world searching. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought you were done. Yeah. All right. Uh, Dan, Dan, you. Next. Dan yeah. on mute. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Bob, uh, what kind of meaning do you think that Darwinian theory imparts to life. And by Darwinian theory, you mean evolution? Yeah, evolution by natural selection. Yeah. Uh, That would be a purely materialistic one, but Darwin himself disavowed that. But it applies a natural meaning in the world, an evolving one, a growing one, changing one. So that would be good. That's a good aspect of it. 
it is limited to the material, and the material is very limited to itself. Usually material doesn't make much meaning unless it's very big. Then it makes some meaning, but that meaning doesn't last long. Yeah, well, do you uh, think there's a possibility that uh, God is Darwinian? Yeah, I do. I, I think God is evolving. That he's not. Uh, I, I, not, not in the sense. Well, God could be evolving, of course, and and changing and adapting to whatever environment God is in. But I, I'm meaning in the sense of, um, you know, God has given us a Darwinian environment to survive in, and and uh, some people. Are, even the concept of heaven and hell, it's, it's almost like if maybe if you lead a meaningful, ethical life, you get to go on. But if you lead a maladaptive uh, life, you don't get to go on. You know, you go to hell or, or something of that nature. Um, it, it, because it just seems as if everything is kind of uh, Darwinian. You know, your thoughts. That's a... Well, evolution is certainly a wide truth, yeah. It yeah. applies to the natural world and it should apply to our world. And Darwin had a big insight, you know, and he made a big revolution, an important one for truth. But again, it's still limited. It's still limited and it's hard to get beyond it. I think the next revolution is going to have to be for making meaning when you get a <laughs> lot of emphasis on making meaning and trying to know how to do that. And that's an incredibly hard job. <laughs> we give our lives different focuses. You know, we focus from first grade on making meaning, which we should. We don't focus on it at all. Yeah. High school, college, college doesn't teach it. Yeah. Although I had a course in it once. <laughs> yeah, Ma making meaning is really adaptive. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's neglected, it's ignored. There's nothing written on making meaning, nothing. My book says it first. There are some books on the meaning of life. But that's very different. The meaning of life is what's the purpose of my life should be, which you started to ask about. And that's incredibly hard. There are some uh, books on that subject if you're interested. You can Google them. I summarize them briefly very briefly in my new book, on my book on making meaning. Toward the very end, I summarize those books. They could help us know the meaning of life. But I have to keep emphasizing, we got to change a lot of things, you know, in our society. A lot of people are hurting for meaning, their lives lack much meaning. You know, especially since this terrible pandemic ruined a lot of things for good, made a few things better. It made meaning harder. We were isolated for so long and now we're scared of each other. People won't come to my house, they're afraid I'll give them COVID. <laughs> what kind of meaning is that? I'll go to my backyard though. <laughs> All right. no out there. There's no germs lurking out there. <laughs> All right, uh, Bob, I, I know Charlie's got his hand up, but I'd like to ask a question too. Um, let's go back to our common dictator, Vladimir Putin, and he's finding his meaning in life by re-inaugurating the Russian Empire and restoring it to his... <laughs> Parts of it, yeah. Um, is he, uh, what do you uh, think about his uh, search for meaning? Totally deluded. He's got no right to that, no claim to that. Mm -hmm. But don't you think and, that uh, certain philosophies will actually lead to that kind of thing in a lot of ways? Uh, it's not a philosophy, it's a mistake in military history that could lead to that. And uh, he's just on totally the wrong path. He's totally mistaken and he's doing a lot of harm to, to the whole world just because of him, a dictator. If there's one person needs a theory of meaning, a philosophy of meaning, it's him. He's way off. Okay. I was just curious um, what you, your, your thoughts were. 
All right, Charlie, please go next. Yeah, Bob, 13.7 billion years ago, the entire known universe, and I state that the entire known universe was a micro dot, a singularity. And if I'm correct, you are theorizing that there was an intangible floating around, I guess, which set the Big Bang in motion, um, which I just thought the limits of human knowledge was the start of the Big Bang, but you are able to trans go over that barrier. And I think you called it God. Yeah, no, I'm not doing it. Scientists are. Scientists are finding this information out. They're the ones who claim that the universe did not exist, not even as a little infinite, little point. Nothing existed 13.7 billion years ago, as far as they can determine. And they're winning Nobel Prizes for this. So the scientific community at its highest agrees with them. Uh, I could ask a question if. Uh, all right, uh, Bob, all right. I'm on first, but Doug, go ahead, and then Bob will get to you next. Okay. Uh, and following up to what we're just discussing here, um, Bob, if if it turned out that there was an abstract um, uh, answer to your question there, that um, first of all the universe might have begun, our universe might have begun at the Big Bang, but there might have been a multitude of universes quote, before that, unquote, which we discussed before. But if you could ultimately um, admit that there could be kind of a bootstrapping effect where um, the very essence of mathematics as an abstract idea and a system of ideas, that it admits the opportunity for quantum mechanics to exist as a mathematical framework and that that in itself which quantum mechanics allows for particles in our own space time to just um, spontaneously be created. Of course, you know, in general, they're imme almost immediately annihilated again, but it allows for that effect. Uh, if that could bootstrap the universe, that God could essentially be like the ultimate quantum computer that existed simply because it can exist, something of that nature, would that would that satisfy your desire for having a God and a first cause? There would be a first cause, but it would just uh, be um, kind of a first cause that goes back in infinite amount of iterations of, of a developing, evolving universe. <laughs> that's a, that's a mind-blowing idea, but that's kind of what I've been thinking about recently as a way to try to describe what might have happened. Yeah, that's a good expression, evolving universe. And you pose another very good question. Um, what is this thing that, and I can't call it a thing. What is the first cause? Is it an idea? I don't like the word idea. A like system it. perhaps of ideas, you know? I mean, mathematics, I mathematics involves a good number of ideas and they're different. Um, Delegate. There are different systems of mathematics, but the fact that mathematical quantum mechanics Bob. does exist and is proven to be consistent Doug's by our, our greatest minds, that enough. could be sufficient enough. It doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you have yeah. to really dig into it a little bit more deeply. And yeah. Ellen went to Tulane, too, so she should know it all, too. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 uh, no, I, I don't like math as God. I don't like ideas as God. That is some sort of spiritual reality. I think it's that. What it is, I don't think we could really comprehend. I don't know anything about physics. Yeah. I wouldn't give much so you, you still want the you still want the uh, old guy in the clouds, you know, with his sticks his finger out. <laughs> well, hell no, not him. Not him, that's terrible. He's At least not old. him, good. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, uh, let's, uh, Bob Matter, you're next. Okay, uh, Bob, um, which, uh, what country do you think has the most abortions in the world? Most what? Um, most abortions. Okay. What I'm back to that. I don't know. Bob, do we have to go back yeah, to the sure, it's irrelevant. Well, I, I just thought I'd bring it up. It's, it's Russia. And my my point being that uh, that uh, that uh, when I when I when I became pro life, it's because I realized that abortion uh, cheapens life, and I think that now in the in the fifth year that Roe v. Wade has been legal here in the United States, um, we've seen the the you know the results of cheapening life on our culture. Look at the uh, Look at the crime wave in Chicago. You know, people will shoot you for, uh, you know, pocket change for a hundred dollar cell phone. You know, numerous Chicagoans have been murdered for for a hundred dollar cell phone, for instance. Yeah, because of abortion. Uh, because it well, it's because, because of capitalism. What the, the, it, wouldn't you say I, I, that it's because life those become cheap to people? Uh, there's life has yeah. no meaning, uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, Okay. Your buddy Putin has killed more people recently than anybody else. <laughs> a case, a case in yeah. point. Uh, and, a case in point yeah, look, look at the culture. Abortion, he's from. Abortion, I, uh, the, the, abortion, having, a, having abortion on demand it greatly reduces the level of crime in, that, uh, in an area. Why don't we all talk at once? Yeah, that, that's been proven, by the way. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Oh, well, Bob brought out an excellent point. <laughs> that is. If your life does lack meaning, you will be mean. You will you will be hostile. You'll be negative. You'll be violent to the extent that your life lacks meaning because you're angry. Thank you very much. End of question. Next person. Okay. Um. Who's next? We haven't heard from. Um. We we got several who haven't uh, commented before. Um. I know Karina Castor's there. If you want to ask a question, please go ahead. Or. Uh, we got two participants, Bob. Okay. Oh, I'll ask something. Uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, Charlie's been a couple <laughs> times already. So, okay. Um, I've only been once. How about me? No, no, go, 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 ahead. Oh. go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Speaking of, uh, you know, what the abortion question, I what makes me frustrated is all, you know, Let's not go back to that. Talking Bob Matter making, you know, talking about abortion, like he knows. And yet, you know, this police state, Russia, what you know, the constitution is, you know, protect life. I mean, that's it's like epistemologically, ontologically a police state rationale, you know, and what gives police and FBI and judges and men and you know the the right to to determine that women you know having abortion is it's a they don't have the right to their own body their own choice you know, it's the constitution it's the body. Yeah. it's like yeah. catholic and the evil popes i mean it really some people we were talking about abortion in the dallas group and they you know these black guy goes, I mean, do they want more black people? It's like, no, clearly, I know for a fact, my stepfather is one of you, Ayn Rand, objectivist, delusional, they would, no, they, they ideologue, you know, types. And it, you know, and it really is fascism. You have to look at this is Nazi fascism <clears throat> when they, because, I mean, it, you know, the, the girl's just gonna kill her fucking self. I mean, you see this movie about, and Roe versus, she, they closed down, no access to abortion. She comes to Illinois, to the one in Alabama or Tennessee, and they said, oh, you can't, the hallways. We have wait, to wait, have wait, wait a second. Wait a second. got to be certified. What's so just question? if you've been What's raped and you've got to have this baby by somebody who wait. raped you all over the fucking country, wait. that's what causes wait. fucking gang violence and evil, having so. fucking gang bangers like you, like dirty cops like you, you know, making people have your fucking babies. You know, you've got some fucking nerve, you patriarchal police state tyrants. Uh -oh. Bob Matter, 
take Orwell off your picture. It turns him in the grave to think that you represent him. You are a police state FBI sabotager of this whole group. And you know it, you, you open your mouth and it speak racism. You know, don't you dare tell people what else to do, you pretense of any morality. Okay, okay, uh, Ellen, thank you. Uh, Charlie, you got the next question. Yeah, Bob, you briefly mentioned that Racist. people report or will. having he the said conversation. Oh, we have to have a course, it's in the Constitution to defend lives. I mean, can everybody um, talk at once? Go ahead. Tim, please silence, sir. I did. Thank you. Uh, back again. Bob, you said that millions of people experience God in their mind, in their thoughts. And you actually seem to say that this should be taken as evidence that God exists. And I, I, I don't fully comprehend how that meets the criteria of valid. And then is it's a subjective experience. It's, it's, there's no way to verify it at all. And I don't believe it's evidence of anything, is it? That's outside of a, a lot of mental activity, right? That's all. Yeah, and for you, the only thing that's real is something physical and you got to touch it. But um, there are many things that aren't physical that are real, you know, and that's what these arguments are appealing to. They're appealing to objective realities like they, the universe. Was it there always? No. Was is it designed too complicated to evolve? Yes. Did some people experience God? Yes, Buddha sure did. And you know, so did Moses. And so God, God, God uses mental thought to communicate with us. I, I, I don't know if you want to go there. No, God doesn't have nothing to do with that. It's humans thinking of them, but they're arriving at um, the need for a God. They, 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 the reasoning showed to them, I wouldn't use the word prove, because that's come to mean physical evidence. And I think that's where you're getting confused. But uh, human need for God is psychology. Well, it, it, there is a big need, as I said, yeah. But uh, we need to know the truth too. Is there a God or not? And those are three arguments that say there are. And there's more, but those are the main ones. Those are the best ones. And they're pretty good. They're pretty strong. They're pointing to something else and giving good reasons. They're not giving any physical proofs. How the hell can you have physical proof for God? That's contradictory. God isn't physical. So how are you going to prove them? You can't. That way it's to find out in the game at the start. Okay. Uh who is uh, who is next on the questions? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Kelvin, um, I've got I've got one. Okay, go sure. ahead, Kelvin. Um, I'm gonna be the I'm gonna be the only the first person at least to bring up um, forty two and the uh, and the author Douglas Adams. Um, he proposed the there is an inherent danger in thinking there's a created universe. Now the uh, analogy he used, he used is imagine a puddle. Now, uh, because he's a comic writer, he can also endow, uh, endow that puddle with a consciousness, right? So there's this puddle on the ground, and it looks around, it, it, it sits there, and that hole is perfectly made for that puddle. I mean, it fits every all, all its nuts and crannies everywhere, up the back of it, round the front, that, that. this must have been made for me, thinks the puddle. Meanwhile, while he's thinking how great this universe is that's been made for him, the sun is shining and he's getting smaller and smaller. And very, very soon, it won't exist. 
when you think of the world as being created for mankind, then you have an inherent um, idea that you can rape it as much as you want. And it's not really because it's made for you anyway. It's yours. It's a possess possession. It's what God made for you. And that's really not the case. And that's why we're getting more and more fucked up on the environment every day, because they have this idea that the earth was made for us. And it wasn't. We're just an experiment in evolution. And I don't think maybe we'll make it. Okay, uh, Bob, you want to comment? Uh, that's all true. Again, I'm not sure what it has to do with meaning. Uh, nobody said the earth was made for humans. The design argument... Or the design? Well, the Bible, you know, the Bible does. Well, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about... Well, it's somebody, isn't it? You know, like, you know all, all, all the world monastic religions think that the world was made for humans. You know, they, they, they all have, they have like core um, Old Testament at the, at the beginning. I don't think the Bible said that either. I don't know where it said that. Sorry if I wasn't supremely precise. But the design argument holds that the universe has a very, very complex design that couldn't evolve by chance. And uh, there's a big stink about that turn of the 20th century. And then um, seemed to be resolved in favor of the design could not be explained, that's how I understand it, by chance, by evolution. That's, how I, that's what I see of making, that the universe is too finely tuned for that. That was the consensus. There's never going to be total agreement, of course. These are two subjective areas that, you know, that don't have physical evidence that you could point to and settle the argument. Well, I don't know, there's there are more shit. There are more possible chess games than there are atoms in the universe. So to say that um, you could not have as something as diverse when you have multiple choice, where uh, where a species can go. Once you understand the evolution, that all biology makes sense. Why why is that why is that a, a black thorn got huge spikes on it that that, 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 that looks at you like a drunken Glaswegian if you go anywhere near it, and a tomato. So nice that you, that you eat it and then pull its seeds out so it can propagate. Evolution explains all that. Not all of it. Yeah, it does. Yeah, but uh, no. Okay, I got another question. Um, in in man's quest for a religious meaning and faith, would you consider the following a? Uh, definitely a, a true religion or not? I think that's kind of sick. <laughs> it's a joke. It's yeah, a joke. Not very funny. Sorry. That's, that's, that's all right. I was trying to get a little bit of uh, no, a little humor ingested into this thing. Well, we have... Uh, a oh, that's meaningful. <laughs> right, Bob, yeah. before we go back to you, I'd like to open up Sharon or Gary or Melanie or Karina or anybody else. You guys have any questions real quick or not? Before we go back in. And all right, Bob, we're going to get you as a last question and then we'll go to rebuttals if everybody's agreeable. Okay, Bob, go ahead. You'll have the last question. Yeah, yeah Bob, I just wonder if you think that the, uh, if you've been watching this uh, uh, recent uh, wokeism movement like I have, and uh, it also caught on that this was just what we witnessed here is the formation of a new religion without God, uh, a secular secular religion, if you will, uh, basically based on lies from what you know all the evidence suggests, uh, just to make people feel good, saying virtue signal and have a Black Lives Matter poster in their window and a and a rainbow flag on the porch and and uh, nonsense like that. Have you uh, have you picked up on that as well? Yeah, there's some evidence for that. Mm -hmm. Some uh, pretty sure and superficial, but so is our materialistic society to the core, pretty much. Find shallowness everywhere you go. 
It's hard not to think people are stupid most of the time. They're certainly not interested in much. They don't even like things. They don't like ideas. And, you know, look how many people find those appealing. <laughs> how few are interested in that. So it's a sad world yeah, that we've made of it. I really need much more meaning to make me I need to be guided by ideas, you know, by knowledge, not by greed and selfishness and self-centeredness as we are now. And those are the models that we see. We don't see intellectual ones. We have to look very hard to find those. We got a lot of turning around to do. We got a lot of meaning to make. We're a long way from it. But I'm encouraged by the response I'm getting um, to my books. Well, that's good. I'm not going to change things around, though, that's for sure. Okay. Not for <laughs> All right. Let's now, I'd like to go to rebuttals next if we can. And I'd like to know uh, who has a rebuttal tonight. I'll offer one. Okay. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Ellen and then uh, Doug Bankley. Charlie is also going. I know Bob, you probably have one one in your in your belt, I'm sure, right? Yeah, probably safe words. Okay, uh, so I have Ellen, Doug Binkley, Charlie, and Bob. Anybody else, real quick? Seeing none, we'll go with the full rebuttals, unless anybody else. Okay, what I'm going to do is Ellen, Doug Binkley, Bob, and then Charlie. I'll each give you guys about roughly four minutes each because it is getting close to nine. So, Ellen Corley, you can go ahead. I'll start a clock at uh, four minutes and go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, Bob. Uh, I really do agree with your premise. Um, and I, the more I think about it, um, you know, making meaning. I, I was an English teacher. Uh, a market researcher, uh, you know, a social justice advocate and, a, a, you know, a maker of meaning, you know, it really does explain life. Uh, I, you know, it comes down to being a writer. Uh, my, you know, as when I was younger, they, my stepfather would say, you know, you write, you know, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And I, I'd say a student, a student, a student. You know, um, right? I'm, I'm a scholar, uh, you know, and it, it comes down to, but I realized what guides my, my search, my, my writing guides what I read, you know, it's like, it's the questions I ask, the, the hypotheses that I form. That's, I think that's the biggest idea I've got is um, all investigative journalism depends on a hypothesis. And you know, and I, I was like, really? But it's really all thinking, I think, does, you know. Um, and then it, what questions are you asking? What, and it helps one think more critically uh, about things. And that's, I've come to really like critical theory, which includes critical race theory, Adorno and um, Adenar. They, these guys came from fascist Germany and you know, understood the free speech movement that out at Berkeley. And I think that's why, sorry, Bob, but the, you know, the racist, reactionary, right-wing extremist, you know, Blue Lives Matter um, are cracking down on, on a critical race theory, which I can't, but what frustrates me, I have to say a little bit is you know, when he says, what do you think about woke? And, and Bob, you go, oh yeah, you know, materialism. And I do think philosophical materialism is a problem, but um, we don't, it's, we can't really even have a, a, we really don't even know what we're talking about anymore. And that's, you know, I'm sorry to have yelled and stuff, but it, you know, you think about this stuff and you think about the radio and their it's all censored. It's all edited. I, the questions we ask, the people that get to speak, I want to just sometimes, um, you know, uh, I just, 
I, I really just want to give up. I'm so angry. And, um, but then I think, you know, what we have to, you know, if it wasn't for me coming here, bring in rational perspective, you know, and practicing doing that. Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, then, you know, um, like I said, when someone was yelling at me about talking about vaccines and the danger and the poison, and uh, I was like, you know, if people like me don't speak up, that's when you got to be afraid. When somebody isn't coming into the free speech forum and trying to, you know, keep people honest, uh, try to keep their logic right, you know, and, um, you know, so uh, I, I really frustrates me that left wing, open minded, good people are well, supposed must. to be in woke because being woke is, I, Sometimes I wish I wasn't what in the black culture, the people I try to help get free. They, you know, it's a good thing to be woke, you know. I mean, it, it's painful to see that's where it came from, you know. Like, wow, I'm really seeing that there is a lot of racist policing, FBI, CIA, NSA. This is what they were formed to be a police state. So, um, you know, you can see it and it's hard to change it, but, um, I do think making meaning is we've got to write and um, research, you know, and uh, keep people speak truth to power and keep trying. Okay, that's all I got. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Doug Binkley, you want to go next four minutes? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Um, I, think, I think Bob is a very woke person in the sense of uh, Bob is uh, thoughtful. He's using uh, both creative and critical thinking. And uh, so I, I, I very much approve. Um, I also think he's uh, doing what he preaches. He wants people to have a positive meaning in their life. I'm talking about Bob Matter, not I'm, Bob Lichter. I, I know you, I know you were. I'm talking about, I'm, I'm going, to, I think we're rebutting this, the speaker here. So, so I'm talking about Bob Lichtenberg, obviously. obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think Bob Lichtenberg has um, been trying to uh, make a good meaning in his life and also to help improve the lives of other people. And I think that is a very high um, um, honorable and ethical thing to do. So um, I'm only going to take a little, pick a little bone with him. I didn't follow everything on this uh, uh, meeting tonight, but um, in the past I've had criticized him a little bit for um, his uh, uh, criteria for how to make meaning and um, that he's left out, I, I think, uh, in his books, uh, a, um, a large um, a possibility for other people to make uh, meaning of their lives. And I've strived to recently with mine, uh, and that is um, to um, um, be devoting your life to a certain extent to <clears throat> the furtherance of ethical, ethical ideas themselves. Um, or um, uh, things that will um, uh, be of a positive benefit, for example, our society or humankind as a whole. Um, so a lot of time that I've spent, and, and Ellen spent a good bit of her time too. Um, uh, we both were with a group called Refuse Fascism um, uh, for a time. And um, um, the idea was to preserve our democracy and um, to um, fight for freedom and against um, the um, possibility of authoritarianism or um, a group, however large, <laughs> or supposedly um, uh, a, a political party. Now it's become a cult, really. Um, the Republican, Republican Party, but not that they can do anything. I sometimes call them the Republicans because they claim to be conservative, but they're really con artists. That all beside the point, um, uh, I've, I've tried to devote a part of my life to um, uh, now lately going after these uh, Republicans um, and um, uh, Bob might have might have invented the meaningology uh, word. I recently, well, actually six months or so ago, maybe eight, 10 months ago, I invented the idea that the filibuster should be called the democracy buster because of what it's doing to our um, system. A anyway, um, I'm also trying to um, uh, make meaning in my life by trying to uh, help humanity as a whole, and especially um, uh, try to uh, help the Ukrainian people. Um, That's mainly because I have a chronic fatigue and uh, I can't go out there and fight 
<laughs> the battlefield, nor, nor would I want to, um, because um, um, I think that um, uh, my place is uh, still here. Uh, but um, I've uh, been trying to promote the idea um, that um, uh, a particular uh, defensive weapon system they should have they should be entitled to because we the United States helped develop it and we actually have a couple that we could send to them but to my awareness it hasn't been done and it's pretty obvious it hasn't been done and so I've been trying to raise the awareness of this Iron Dome uh, system that both that Israel should provide it even though their prime minister has refused and it is most probably in my opinion that he um, is only selfishly in his own selfish idea of what Israel's interest is, is colluding with Putin, um, whether overtly or, uh, or covertly uh, colluding with Putin. Um, but uh, this, uh, this weapon system, if it could be developed, uh, it could be, if it could be supplied to Israel, if the United States uh, insisted on whether there are some kind of bureaucratic uh, problems with it, the United States ought to be manufacturing it and sending it over to Ukraine and it would save thousands and thousands of lives. So that is my main thing. I, I actually got a little bit of progress by being able to talk directly to two Congress people uh, last week and um, directly, neither one of which would own up that they really knew much about it, although both appeared to be aware of the term Iron Dome. Uh, and both said they would look into it, but I haven't seen any results yet. Uh, it's, it's a slow thing, slow thing to make progress. Um, um, but, um, in the with the object of making meaning for one's life, I think um, trying to um, uh, help uh, humanity is maybe one of the highest um, uh, uh, goals. Okay, let's wrap it up. Let's wrap okay it up. I'll shut up. I guess everybody else wants to talk. No, no, that's okay. Now we've got uh, Bob. Bob, Bob, Bob Matter is next. We'll take a ring after that. Okay, uh, Bob, you got something, and then Karina will raise her hand. Hit something down here again. Uh, just okay. as an aside, um, I put the Bible quote where God gave the earth to man on the chat. Okay. Um, but, uh, Bob, I want to let Bob know that I finally bought his book, <laughs> uh, the, the one making meaning, the one that means, uh, uh, which I just started reading, and uh, it, it looks it looks promising. Uh, <laughs> so say don't don't judge a book by its cover. I, I don't care for the cover of that book, but uh, but it looks like there may be some good uh, reading inside. So I'm I'm looking forward to, to finishing it off. Um, as far as uh, make you know make uh, bringing meaning, uh, let's say meaning for life, meaning to life. Of course, you have to have life first uh, before it can have meaning. So uh, they'll take us back to the the abortion issue. I, I found, found it amusing that Ellen Corley says that uh, that, uh, that uh, pro-lifers are, are Nazis, uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 which are the Nazis were the ones that were the catalyst for changing my thinking uh, to becoming pro-life. Because you, when you see you know the the, the you know the mass murders that they did. Obviously, they had no uh, no respect for for life, and they you know life was cheap to them. The way they just you know murder people by the millions, uh, and that's sort of what really turned turned it for me. I thought, well, you know, you know life has you know has to have uh, uh, you know value and meaning. And uh, and like I said, over over fifty years, you know, we've seen uh, what this cheapening of life. Uh, uh, is sort of done to uh, has, has done to us. Uh, I am not religious. I'm actually, you know, an atheist, but that does not mean that I uh, I I uh, don't follow uh, you know the Constitution. Uh, I think the Constitution is a, a great document, and I think that if you want to find meaning in life. Um, one thing to do would be to uh, support the principles in the Constitution, and that would be, and that would be uh, for things like uh, individualism, uh, for succeeding on merit, for, for a limited for a limited government, personal responsibility. 
all the things that, <laughs> that are the the, the uh, Democrats seem to be doing the opposite. Uh, you know, they want uh, you know the, <laughs> this identity politics, tribalism, um, pandering to uh, you know voters with uh, with handouts, <coughs> all that kind of stuff. Uh, has gotten us into a lot of trouble, eh? I think, and uh, I think we need to steer back towards uh, those founding fathers and, uh, and the principles uh, that they set up in the Constitution. Okay, that's it. Okay, thanks, Bob. All right, Karina, I owe you an apology. I booted you out once earlier, but we've been having some trouble with uh, trolls on our website, so my apologies, please. But I'm oh, you- I was I was nearly in tears because I thought that maybe you had known me from somewhere else where no, 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 my, no, opi- just- my opinion, and you didn't want me in the group. This is the first time I'm ever here. Right. And I, and, okay, apology accepted. But anyway, I want anyway. I just want to put in my two cents. Please, uh, for, got four for, minutes. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, yeah. For the for the person, uh, it, it is wrong and it is nonsense to think that Israel is supporting Putin because Russia was always supporting the countries opposed. To Israel, whether it was communist, whether it was after communism collapsed, uh, Russia always supported Syria and the Arab countries, you know, in the interest of oil and in the interest of export. And so, uh, and so they would be very, and Russia was always very anti Semitic, even under the Tsar. So the Israelis would certainly think twice about supporting Putin. And the other thing. I want to say is about the whole abortion debate. Instead of uh, you know being yes abortion, no abortion, why can't people concentrate uh, on putting women in a position where they would not have to make the choice, and that yes. would be through expanding birth control and contraception and and. And contraception and educating teenagers, you know, about birth control, even allowing schools to distribute con- contraceptives to teenagers, work to make the need to choose abortion or not to choose it unnecessary, work for birth control, and, you know, preventing something from happening is different from destroying something that's already there, like a fetus or an embryo. And that's my two cents. <laughs> Uh, Karina, we thank you very much for contributing. And again, I uh, apologize. It's just we've had, um, like I said, we were having some troubles with some teenagers and in interrupting us with trolling. So again, when I booted you, I made a mistake. So I apologize. And thank you for coming tonight. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, um, Charlie, I, who else has got a comment before I let Charlie go? Anybody else real quick before we go? Charlie, Sharon, you want anything or not? Okay. Um, all right, Charlie, you got the floor. And then Bob, you'll get the last all right, one. Let's all thank our speaker for my presentation. Actually, Bob, I must commend you for the many times I've heard you speak on this topic. This was by far and away the most concise and articulate presentation that you have ever given on the topic. I mean that. It was very, very well done. Uh, I'm going to talk about three things. That was the first one. A good talk. Number two, uh, I think you ought to steer clear of science altogether in your thinking and your presentation. It is the antithesis of uh, intangible discussion. I don't think it establishes anything uh, whatsoever or has any relevance or nexus connection to the topic. Uh, science is in a different uh, frame of thought. And the other thing is, I'd also steer a little clearer of this God concept, which many people embrace uh, in wholesale fashion uh, to give their lives meaning. I, I'm not certain if I totally think that is the wisest course of action. But that's just my advice 
which you're free to discard. Uh, that two more things. One, everyone buy a copy of the book. There's a link on our website, College to Complexes for June. Uh, or, and second thing, Bob has his monthly discussion groups. If you like discussing philosophy, I can highly recommend it, having been in attendance for many, many years um, at them, and recommend that uh, you take them in in formal discussions. You don't need any steep or deep background in, in philosophy to participate in the discussions. It's a very friendly atmosphere. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. And let me know when you got another one, Bob. Farewell, Tom. Um, I'd like to say you something to, um, to, to Bob, Bob, Bob Bayer. It was your well guy. I can't believe you really said the last time. Um, I think you're mistaken, uh, mistaken about wokeness. Wokeness is simply the democratization of criticism. Yeah. If we now live in the, in the age of the internet, right? <laughs> where if you'll find something offensive, you can generally make your high you know, known. Or yeah. if you find something pretty, really good, you can make your, your views known. So what we're having now is rather than uh, an elite bunch of critics in a, in a New York Times or, 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 the, or the Guardian telling us what we should or should not say, we have the, the entire internet to say, actually, you know what, if, if you were in my shoes, you wouldn't find that so funny, mate, right? Or, yeah, I totally get it. Uh, I've been there. Um, well, it's, it's just like yeah. that, you yeah? know? Whatever. Yeah. That's what wokeness is. And the fact that you may object to a uh, Black Lives Matter and a rainbow and stuff like that, well, guess what? That's constitutional. That's in your First Amendment. You should be proud that they got Black Matters, Black Lives Matter stuff and rainbows because it's their bloody right. And that's their country that you live in, that you love so much. So live with it, man. Okay. Bobby, you got the last word. Go ahead, please. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. Um, thanks, Charlie, for agreeing with me. And uh, even though we have a lot of basic differences, um, yeah, I think we all want to make meaning. That's the way to have the biggest impact in our lives. That's what we all should be aiming for. That's why we're here. We won't know what the great purpose of our lives are right away. Yeah. Or even searching all our lives. But we will get broader truths. We'll get bigger and bigger truths. On the path and we'll be able to do more and more, make more and more meaning, do more good. More justice, see more beauty, be freer. We'll be able to live fuller and richer in the best lives that we can. Uh, but the, <clears throat> the idea of making meaning is the biggest truth. It's universal, it applies to everyone. Everyone's life has some meaning, at least, at least to their parents. And that makes it though a difficult idea <coughs> to get a hold of. But as I said, we can get parts and parts of it. Uh, one truth, I meant, one topic I wish I had mentioned was Freud. Sigmund Freud, a psychologist on religion, in a little book he wrote that the reason people believe in God is because they're afraid of death. They don't want to accept their death as final. So they make this father figure in the sky up that's going to save them forever. But it's a delusion. It's a neurosis, he called it, a slight neurosis, an inability to accept um, the reality of death. But Freud was a materialist, and only a materialist would make a claim like that. Uh, he's right that these people are wrong, but he hasn't gotten on to trying to know the truth beyond that. And you can't if you're going to be a materialist. So 
So I think that's all um, I have to say right now. I appreciate all of you spending so much time. This is way too long. <laughs> and, and I appreciate your, your concern and your interest very much. Very encouraging. But I say, go out and make meaning now. Make meaning with everything you do and all your actions. Try to make it more meaningful. Your relationships at work. Your time off. Many people just kill their time. That's horrible. That's the worst thing you could do with it. Make meaning with it. And you can do it. If you're willing to think about it and work on it. So let's go do it now. Thank you very much, everybody. And as far as uh, Karina's question in the chat, yes, we'll be at the same link next week. If you look at our website, it's collegeofcomplexes.org. Log in about six o'clock and we'll be more than happy to see you. And as I said, you know, our, our, our philosophy is one fool at a time and no personal attacks. And I'll just close with this. A fool is not interested in understanding, but only in the revealing of his own mind out of the book of Proverbs. <laughs> we get a lot of people here tonight doing just that. With that, uh, six o'clock, uh, no, six o'clock Central Standard Time. And, uh, you know, that's, that's Central Standard, Karina. Um, we'll, be than, we'll be more than happy to have you come back. And again, like I said before, we were having some real trouble with some uh, trolls just coming in, they would log in with a name we didn't recognize. The next thing you know, they'd be disruptive and, and all kinds of stuff. And I at first thought you may have been um, may have been doing that, but you know, it, it's again. I apologize if you uh, taken any offense, and I'll uh, take responsibility. We'd like to have you next week with us, as well as everybody else. And uh, with that. Okay. Good night. I'll, 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 I'll Good night, log off, but we'll stay on for a while for further discussion. Good